Hello and welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you for joining us. Our guest today is Dr. Hugh McTavish. He's a company founder, president, and CEO of SquareX LLC. Now, SquareX LLC is a clinical stage pharmaceutical company, and he's joining us here on the program to talk about his company developing a topical formulation for the prevention of recurrent cold sores and some other infections that are caused by herpes simplex 1 uh, and uh, simplex virus 2. Welcome to the program, Dr. McTavish. Uh, thank you for having me, Neil. A bit of your background, uh, you are the uh, founder of SquareX. Uh, what did you do and what are you still doing uh, as president and CEO of the company? Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm the founder. I, uh, um, uh, I actually... I'm also a patent attorney and a, and a biochemist, and I invented the drug actually out of my own experience of having frequent cold sores and my desperation to find something to uh, prevent or treat them, and uh, hit upon this idea, treated myself initially, uh, and um, seemed to work, so I started a company around it and filed a patent application for it, and, and uh, we've moved forward. That's the, I guess, the abbreviated version. Um, certainly, there are some compounds that, that you came across. Uh, you say you had cu- recurring uh, cold sores. Uh, what is the difference uh, between cold sores and uh, other types of, of herpes, the virus 1, the virus 2? How do they <clears throat> differ? Uh, well, cold sores, cold sores occur, or um, uh, technically called herpes labialis, or oral herpes. Uh, and those are outbreaks on the board, usually on the border of the lip, sometimes on the the um, border of the nostrils, uh, or other places on the face or or, or the lip. Mm-hmm. They're usually on the border between the skin and the and the lip. Um, and uh, so those those break out. They they last uh, typically about two weeks or so. Um, uh, forms a red spot that uh, often opens up and then crusts over later. Uh, and that's typically caused by herpes simplex virus 1, sometimes by uh, herpes simplex virus 2, HSV2. Mm-hmm. Uh, and ge- genital herpes is similar, but the outbreaks are on the, ge- on the genitals, and that is typically caused by HSV2, but sometimes by, by HSV1. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, HSV1, so the HSV1, um, the gen- genital outbreaks, uh, genital herpes is, is um, con- contracted by uh, by uh, by sex. Uh, oral herpes is typically contracted by oral contact, and actually, I understand most commonly um, people get it as infants. Though the, the large majority of the population is infected with HSV1, and typically people get it as infants. Uh, I'm told by being kissed by their parents. Well, this drug that we're here to talk about today, is this uh, your lead drug? Uh, what's it called? And is it for the prevention, the treatment, or a little bit of both? Uh, it's for the prevention. Mm-hmm. Uh, the The compound is, is called squaric acid dibutyl ester. Uh, it acts much like, uh, much like poison ivy, actually. Mm-hmm. It causes a... Um, the immune response on the rash, that's what poison ivy is. It's a, um, it's basically tricks your immune system to thinking your skin is a foreign object and your, your uh, immune system, T cells in particular, attack the skin. Um, and stroke acid dibutyl ester acts by a similar mechanism, uh, we think anyway. Uh, and so it can cause a rash in some people. In, in most people in our clinical trial, it, it does not cause a rash. Um, but uh, in some cases, that causes a rash. The rash is, is called a delayed type hypersensitivity response because it does not typically happen immediately after application of the drug. It's delayed because it's, because it's an immune response. It takes your immune system some time to to come up with the response, so it peaks two or three days after the after the application of the drug. <clears throat> now, when you say developing a rash, are we talking about where the uh, the compound is uh, applied on the lip or the nose or somewhere else on the face? Uh, yeah, the rash would be where the compound is applied. But the the great thing about this is, which was actually a surprise to us, um, I'd initially treated myself by applying it to my lip when I was having an outbreak. Um, but we 
in our clinical trial, we dosed people on the arm mm -hmm. uh, to sensitize them to the compound. So next time they got exposed to the compound, they would develop a stronger immunity. We dosed them once on the arm, and then the plan was we would dose them two or three weeks later. Uh, we would dose them when they had an outbreak, provided mm -hmm. that outbreak was at least two weeks after the dosing. Um, and uh, uh, and this was a placebo-controlled trial, so some people got, got vehicle, uh, and some people got the vehicle with the drug dissolved in it. And... Uh, and lo and behold, most people who got the drug didn't have another outbreak, and wow. most people who got, got the vehicle did have another outbreak off after just the dose on the arm. So we learned that we didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to dose on the face, which is, of course, a great advantage because if you're going to get a rash, you'd much rather have it on, on your arm than on your lip or your face. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so, so anyway, that was, that was the story of how we discovered we, we didn't, that uh, we could just dose on the arm. Well, I mentioned that uh, the large majority of the population is infected uh, as as um, infants, so that's a, a huge uh, a huge market for the, for the compound. What are some other potential treatments for the drug? Uh, yeah, it is a huge compound huge market. So, so the majority of the population is infected with HSV one. Uh, the figures I've seen uh, is that fifteen percent of the population had at least one outbreak in the past. Uh, a little over two percent had six or more outbreaks over the past. Uh, 12 months. So yeah, there's a big, there's a big market. Um, we've done another clinical trial that the, um, the compound, as you can understand, it, it, it induces, this virus. I understand that it, it works for other pathogens, at least other mm -hmm. viruses, uh, because there's not, it's not like it's a inhibitor of HSV1 replication specifically or something. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've done it, we've actually done another clinical trial where we dosed people with frequent outbreaks once with the drug, um, and then we collected their blood before dosing and two weeks and eight weeks after dosing, and tested, tested that for um, in vitro uh, in the lab for various immune functions, in particular immune response to HSV-1 virus. And um, people we also we also tested people. Uh, we didn't dose them, but we collected blood from people who have zero or one outbreak and uh, so infected with the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, so we compared the traits of people with good immune control and bad immune control of HSV1. And the people with uh, with good immune control basically they, their their immune cells proliferated more. They had a bigger immune response to the virus in vitro than people with frequent outbreaks and bad immune control. Uh, so, we, um, so we tested their blood two weeks and eight weeks after dosing and compared it to how it was when we blood we'd collected from the same people immediately before dosing. And uh, two weeks later, there was really no, no difference. But eight weeks later, they were uh, substantially better, significantly uh, better immune response to the virus. Uh, and also, interestingly, they had a bigger immune response to um, to a, a yeast extract uh, that nearly everybody's expo been exposed to that too. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, it's used as a <clears throat> as a test uh, test antigen for general general immune function. Um, so so we think it'll work for HSV two and genital herpes as well as HSV one. And and probably a number of other uh, viral diseases. I'm not so sure about colds and flu, mm -hmm. but um, but viruses that have taken up residence and endemically infected you, like HSV1 and HSV2 do, uh, it, it should be beneficial, I think, for those as well. Okay. Quickly, when do you expect uh, or anticipate FDA approval? Um, I think we're going to start our pivotal clinical trials in 2019, and so I would hope we could get FDA approval in 2021. Best of luck, and it sounds uh, extremely promising. I, I don't see uh, any problem on my end, but hey, you know, I'm just the uh, the host here you on know, this radio show, so uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, FDA always yeah, finds problems. But. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for coming in, and um, I'm hoping to talk to you again. Okay. Thank you, Neil. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, listen in, and download at SoundCloud. 
and be sure and visit our affiliates page at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. Thank you for listening to Health Professional Radio. We're very proud to be an independent broadcaster providing our content free of charge to you, the listener. One of the ways that we're able to remain free and independent is by having people like you become patrons. You can support Health Professional Radio simply by visiting hpr.fm and clicking the button that says Become a Patron. Your patronage of even just $1 a month lets us know that you're there, which in turn makes us more valuable to advertisers. And, of course, if you're able to afford more, then we would certainly appreciate the support. My name is Toby Longhurst from Health Professional Radio. Please visit hpr.fm, click the Become a Patron button, and support us if you can.